Extinction by Aaron Dembski Bowden. Narrated by Six Pass Kyokan. Legions die by betrayal. They die in fire and futility. Above all, they die in shame. Kalen Garrax, Sergeant of Garrax Tactical Squad, Sons of Horus, 59th Company. His armor is wrecked, blasted, and cracked. Gunmetal grey with the sea green paint scorched away into memory. Across his helm's left side, image intensifiers refocus with smooth whirs, miraculously undamaged from his fall. His men are in pieces around him. Medes is a dismembered ruin, his component parts scattered over the rubble. Vladak is impaled through the chest, decapitated by junk, twitching in a spread of bloodstained sand. Dion and Fede had been closest to the defense turret's power generator when their length of the wall exploded under a gunship strafing run. Kalen has a flash memory of both warriors covered in chemical fire, burning as the shockwave sent them sprawling. Their scorched remains scarcely resemble anything human. He doubts they'd been alive when they hit the ground. Smoke rises all around him, though the wind steals the worst of it. He can't move. He can't feel his left leg. Jagged wreckage lies strewn in every direction. A particularly sharp chunk of it impales his thigh, pinning him to the charred ground. He looks back at the burning stronghold, with its remaining turrets firing at the gunship strafing the battlements, and an entire wall broken open to the enemy. Across the desert, the enemy come on in a dusty horde, half occluded by the dirty smoke thrown up by their bag tires and smoking engines, dirty silver on a dull, desecrated blue. The Night Lords, riding in wild unity. He keeps his calm, speaking over the Vox, demanding Titan support that he knows isn't coming, despite the Princeps' promise. They're betrayed, left here to die under Eighth Legion guns. Kalen looks up at the plasteel bar driven through the meat of his leg and gives it an experimental tug. Even with pain nullifiers flooding his bloodstream, the grind of metal against bone peels his pale lips back from his teeth in a snarl. Takuru gash keres! He calls out in Cathernic. Takuru gash keres! A howl sounds closer. Mechanical and full-throated. Jump jets. Whining to a close. Velyasha shar shar meres ma! Asks a voice in a language he doesn't speak. He knows the sound of Nostromon tongue of the sunless world, but speaks none of it himself. A shadow eclipses the world's poison sky. It isn't one of his brothers. It doesn't offer a hand to help him rise. Instead, it aims a bolter down at his face. Kalen stares into the gun barrel, dark as the nothingness between worlds. His eyes flick left, where his own bolter lies in the rubble, out of reach. With his leg impaled, it might as well be half a world away. He unlocks his helm's seals and pulls it free, feeling the desert wind on his bleeding face. He wants his killer to see him smiling. Sovan Kairil, Tech Marine, bound to the Sons of Horus 101st Company. The bridge burns around him, shrouding his vision with greasy smoke the ventilators have no hope of scrubbing into something breathable. To compensate, his eye lenses cycle through filters, Thermal sight reveals nothing but smears of migraine heat. Motion sensing tracks the crew staggering and suffocating on the deck, and slouched in their seats. The ship dying around him is the Hevelius, a destroyer of some renown in the Sons of Horus fleet. Like so many of the Legion's ships, she was a terror when the throne world burned. The last sight Kyrell had of the Orspex displays showed the flickering runes of the Death Guard fleet closing into killing range, herding the outnumbered and outgunned Sons of Horus vessels into showing their bellies. The Death Guard meant to finish this up close and personal. They'd get their wish, in a matter of moments. K. Ral's dense ceramite acts as a heat shield against the fires consuming all life around him. Retinal displays mark the temperature close to melting flesh and muscle from the bone. Sirens wail without respite, never needing to pause for breath in the choking smoke. He hurls himself at the control throne, throwing aside the slack's corp to be of Hevelius' asphyxiating captain. Through the smoke, he keys a code into the console built into the armrest. Shipwired Vox comes alive with a nasty, wet crackle. Circuits are melting all across the ship, diseased and rotting and burning. All hands, he says through the helm's mouth grill speaker. All hands, 
Abandon ship! Nebuchadnezzar, captain of the Sons of Horus 30th Company. He exhales a rancid, coppery breath from his lungs, feeling bloody spit stringing between his teeth. One of his hearts has failed, now a cooling dead weight in his chest. The other beeps like a heathen war drum, overworked and out of rhythm. His face is on fire with the pain of the lash wounds tiger striping his flesh. The last whip crack stole one of his eyes. The one before that opened his throat to the gristle. He raises his sword in time for the whip to lash back, wrapping his fist in the hilt in a serpentine rush. A sharp pull tears the weapon from his grip. Disarmed, half blind, breathless, Desh falls to one knee. For the war master! With his ravaged throat, the words are as strengthless as a whisper. His enemy answers with a bellow, loud enough to shake Desh's remaining eye in its socket. The wall of sound hits him with a rippling physicality, denting and bending his armor plating in a series of resonating clangs. He stands against the wind for three erratic heartbeats until it breaks his balance, hurling him down and sending him skidding across the landing platform with a squeal of ceramite on rustling iron. As he tries to rise, a boot presses down on the back of his head, grinding his mutilated face into the iron deck. He feels his teeth snapping in their sockets gluing to the inside of his mouth with thick, corrosive saliva. Fall out! His benediction ends in a voiceless gurgle as the blade slides lovingly home into his spine. Zarian Sharak, brother of the Sons of Horus 86th Company. A seeker, a pilgrim, a visionary. He seeks out the Neverborn, Surrendering his flesh to demons as a statue of meat and bone offered up for reshaping, he pursues them, proves himself to them with sacrifices of blood and souls, forever seeking the strongest to ally with him within his own skin. He no longer recalls how long he's been on this world, nor how long the World Eaters have been chasing him. He isn't here to run from them. He's here to stand and face them. They chase him now, laughing and howling up the side of the mountain. Sharak can hear the mad wetness in their words and pays their frothing laughter no heed. His muscles burn. The last demon to dwell within his flesh was cast out seven nights before, leaving him drained and anemic in search of another. Soon, he knows. Soon. His gauntleted hand grips the rocky ledge above. He has the briefest moment to smile at the bolt shells bursting stone into fragments nearby before he hauls himself up and out of the World Eater's line of fire. The shrine awaits him, as he knew it would, though it resembles nothing he'd expected. A single sculpture, weathered by mutable time, reduced to something stunted, formless, vague. Perhaps it had once been an Eldar, in the era when this entire region of space had been the domain of that second, weak alien breed. You found me, comes the voice in his mind. Sharak sweats at the silent sound. He turns, seeing nothing but the deformed statue in the endless expanse of glass desert in every direction. Sharak, it beckons. Your enemies draw near. Shall we end them, you and I? Sharak is no fool. He's hoard his flesh as a weapon to devils and spirits alike. But he knows the secrets most of his brothers lack. Discipline is all it takes to maintain control. Even the strongest of the Neverborn is no match for the strength of a guarded, warded human soul. They could share his flesh, but never dominate his essence. This demon is strong. It has demanded much of him these last months, and here at the precipice, it offers everything he needs to save his life. But he is no fool. Caution and care are his watchwords when dealing with this realm's creatures. He's seen too many of his brothers become scorched husks, home to demonic intelligence, all trace of themselves scoured and scraped away from within. The World Eaters howl below, not like wolves, but fanatics. It's the lack of anything feral that makes it so sickening to hear, so much more of a threat. A beast's howl is a natural thing. A fanatic's cry is something of anger and tormented joy in equal measure, born of spite and twisted faith. He turns back to the stunted stone pillar. You've followed my voice for a hundred days and nights. You've made foes of brothers and cousins alike, just as I ask. 
And now you stand before the stone that sinners once carved in my image. You've proven yourself in every way I asked of you. You are worthy of this union. What now, Sharak? What now? I'm ready, Sharak says. He bares his throat in a symbolic gesture and pulls his helm free. He can hear the rattle and grind of Severmite over rock. The World Eaters are almost upon him. The joining is different each time. Once it was a hammer blow to his sternum, as if the demon wriggled its way through an invisible puncture hole into his body. Another time, it came as a burst of consciousness and sensuality, perceiving shadows of lost souls moving at the edge of his eyes, and hearing whispers on the wind from entire worlds away. This time, it strikes with heat, with a burning itch across the skin. He feels the joining physically at first, a welcome violation of his flesh despite the bleeding and choking. It hurts down to his bones, weighing them down, driving him to his knees. His eyes turn next, hardening in their sockets, fusing to the bone behind. He taps them, scratches them, pulls at them, their stones in his skull edged by spines pushing from his face. The strength is narcotic in its intensity. No combat drugs, no stimulant serum can match the energy feeding the fibers of his muscles. He starts to claw at his armor plating, no longer needing its protection. Ceramite peels away in chunks, making room for the chitinous ridges beneath. Sharak looks past the pain, refocusing, seeking to calm his racing hearts. Control. Control. Control! It's only pain. It won't kill him. It can be overcome. It... It hurts. It hurts more than the agonies, all past joinings. It hurts to his core, beyond his flesh, hurting past the aches in his bones into something deeper and truer and infinitely more vulnerable. A lesson here, the voice says. Not all pain can be controlled. Sharak turns, screaming through a mouth now crammed with knife teeth. His jaw barely obeys him. His voice strangles off, killing the cry, and becomes someone else's laugh. Not all enemies can be beaten. Fear, fear for the first time in his life, floods through his organs in an adrenal rush. Erikan Jurek, captain of Vythan Revo Squad. Lasfire slashes past him, ionizing the air he breathes and leaving scorched smears across his armor. He ignores the incidental beams, firing back at the humans with his bolter kicking in his fist. The turbines on his back are heavy, broken things that no longer breathe flame. They stutter and sigh, exhaling smoke and bleeding Prometheum. At his boots, his brother Joron is cursing him and thanking him. All at once, Yurik drags Joron by the backpack, hauling him meter by meter up the gunship's ramp. Both of them leave a snail's trail of fluid along the rigid metal. Zoron leaves a path of his blood where his legs now end. Yurik leaves a dripping track of leaking oil and fuel, with spent shell casings clanging down on the metal ramp by his boots. In the gunship's cargo bay, hastily loaded crates wait in ramshackle order with wounded warriors in abundance. Shersan, he foxes. Go! Yes, Captain, comes the confirmation floored by Vox Crackle. For a moment, Yurik smiles, even under enemy fire. Captain, an echo of an era when the Legion still had a structure. From the time before they were hunted like dogs by those they'd failed. With a shudder, the ramp starts its grinding rise. The gunship kicks, lifting off the ground in a cloud of engine wash and swirling dust. Yurik releases Joron, tosses his empty bolter into the gunship's waiting cargo bay and starts running. Don't! His downed brother warns through pain hisses. Erekan, don't do this! Yurik doesn't answer. He drops from the rising ramp, thudding back down onto the rocky ground, breaking stones beneath his boots. In his fists, both weapons whine as their crew power in unison. The curving axe shivers with lightning dancing over its silver blade while the plasma pistol trembles with the heating of its spinal coils. Bursts of gas will leave the pressure from muzzle veins. It wants to fire. He knows this gun and he knows its will. It wants to fire. The humans are upon him now. He faces them at the heart of the burning fortress, 
while evacuating gunships rise into the grey sky. The first is a woman, her face a canvas of fresh scars, invoking gods she scarcely understands. Two men run behind her, armed with salvaged twists of metal, their violated flesh different only from the woman's in the cartography of their mutilations. But the same in intent. A mob charges behind the three leaders, screaming and chanting, killing each other in a bid to reach him. Faith gives them courage, but their zealotry has driven them past the point of self-preservation. Yurik starts butchering them, saving the overkill of his pistol for what will surely come afterwards. Swing after swing takes him through the rabble, his axe never ceasing, blood flecks his eye lenses and sizzles as it burns away from his energized blade. These lives are meaningless. Kaltep! He breathes the name through his Voxhelm speakers. Face me! The reply is a psychic pulse of distant mirth. Now why would I want to do that? Yurik puts his boot through the chest of the last man standing, and runs even as the body falls. Another shadow darkens the sky as a gunship judders overhead, before the concussive boom of its engines lift into the storm, as if in sympathy for the falling fortress. Rain starts in a hissing torrent. It does nothing to fight the fires. Breathless, Yurik asks the Vox, Who's still on the ground? Name runes and acknowledgement pulses flicker across his retinal display, along with a chorus of voices. The stronghold will fall before the hour turns, and half of his men are still inside its sundered walls. He crosses the courtyard, leaping the green-armoured bodies of his dead brethren, heading to one of the last remaining buildings. The defence turrets are silent now, all as broken as the battlements. Thousand Suns gunships, stark and dark in the rain, drift over the tumbled plasteel walls. Their battle tanks rumble in through holes torn in the stronghold's barricades. With them come phalanxes of the walking dead, directed by unseen hands. Kaltep, he says again, where are you? Closer than you think, Yurik. Yet another shadow blacks out the sky, this one cast by a vulturish gunship of old indigo and worn gold, not fleeing in shame but bearing down in triumph. Yurik throws himself into the vague cover of a fallen wall, his eyes activating retinal wounds on his eye lenses. I need anti-armor fire in the southern courtyard. Do we have anything left? The responses aren't encouraging. At least more of his men are escaping. That's what matters. The Thousand Suns gunship burns the air with heat haze from its engines, hovering above the courtyard. Its spotlights cut down through the darkness, raking over the desecrated ground. Where did you go, son of Horus? I thought you wanted to face me. Was I wrong? The gunship's landing claws bite into the earth, grinding bodies beneath their weight. As the engines cycle down, the ramp beneath the cockpit starts to lower a moor opening to breathe warriors into war. Yurik watches the rubricae march forth. His targeting reticule leaps from enemy to enemy, detecting mismatching life signs that suggest everything and conclude nothing. Are these men alive or dead? Both, perhaps, or neither. Vithan, to me. Three runes flash in response. It'll do, it's enough. He wills his jump pack to fire, but the turbine's response is a shudder and a shower of sparks. He's grounded, and will need to do this the traditional way. Unopposed, three seconds is all it will take to close the distance. Four or five if they land more than one hit, which is likely. Theron strikes from above, landing boots first into the phalanx of the walking dead. Dusty ceramite breaks beneath his impact, and two automatons in the blue and gold of the Thousand Suns go down into the dirt falling with no sound of protest. Yurik starts running the moment Theron lands, for all his flaws which he considers many and varied. He's no coward. The rubricase bolters bark in his direction the moment he rises into sight. Whatever independence death stole from them it left them able to aim. Each explosive hit is a horse kick to his body, blasting ceramite shards away and sending him staggering, cursing the loss of flight. Temperature gauges flicker in alarm as his armor starts to burn with blue witchfire. He finishes the first by taking its head, cleaving the stylized Warhelm free. Dust bursts from the neck in a thin cloud, with the smell of tombs best left untouched. With the breath of dust comes a faint, relieved sigh. Yurik doesn't see the headless body fall, 
He's already moved on. Axe leading the way. Theron duels two of the enemy, easily weaving aside from their heavy, precise swings. Yurik is almost at his brother's side when protesting engines herald the arrival of Raxic and Narada. Both hit the ground amidst the Thousand Suns' formation. Chain blades revving, bolt pistols crashing. Yurik staggers again, down on one knee. His axe falls from his grip. The witchfire washes over his armor, refusing to burn out, digesting the ceramite and eating into the softer joints. Jordan! calls one of the other reavers, even through the pain biting at his joints. Yurik tries to tell them it's futile. The apothecary is already gone, evacuated on the way to Monument. He tastes the acid of his own spit on his tongue, and hears the sorcerer's voice in his mind. This is how a legion dies. The warship sits silent in space, her reactor cold, her engines dead. Battlements line her spine in a protrusion of castles and spires with thousands of powerless gun turrets aimed up into the void. She drifts alone at the heart of an asteroid field, suffering occasional impacts against her scarred armor, each slow crash adding to the asymmetry of her scars. She once carved her name through the galaxy at the vanguard of humanity's empire, a bloodthirsty herald of eminent domain. She once hung in the skies of terror, laying waste to mankind's cradle. Now she lies still, abandoned in hell, hidden from those who covet her. Her spirit is a tight, tiny essence in her inactive core, the only iota of sentience and life within the immense hulk. This soul, as true as any human life despite its artificial genesis, slumbers in the infinite cold. She waits to be reawakened, but holds no hope it will ever happen. Her sons fled her decks, leaving her here to grow frigid and silver with ice crystals, so far from the light of the closest sun that the star is nothing but a pinprick in the night. She dreams a warrior's dreams, of fire, of pain, of blood soaking across steel while great guns roar. She dreams of the many that once lived within her, and the warmth they took when they left. She dreams of the time she broadcast her name to lesser vessels, shrieking vengeful spirit as she crippled and killed her enemies. She dreams of the last words spoken in her presence, ordered in the low growl of the one who had come to command her. She knew him, as she knew all of the many. He'd stood before her machine spirit hardcore, a massive clawed hand against the glass of her brain. Her mind filled the cavernous chamber, shielded and armoured in dense metal. Liquids bubbled, engines groaned, pistons clanked, the sound of her thoughts. Abaddon, she'd said to him, we can still hunt, we can still kill. You need me. He couldn't hear her. He wasn't linked. So he could neither hear nor respond. She knew that had been intentional. He was deafening himself to her, to make the abandonment easier. He'd spoken the final three words then. The last words she heard with the clarity of consciousness. Shut her down! Ab- Ezekiel the Brotherless, a pilgrim in hell. He stands at the edge of a cliff that reaches impossibly high into a city the colour of madness and migraines. And he looks down at the armies warring below. Ants. Insects. A crusade of souls the size of sand grains, half lost in the dust churned up from the hammering of so many thousands of boots and tank treads. His armour is a patchwork panoply of scavenged ceramite, repaired countless times after countless battles. The armour he wore in the Rebellion is long since abandoned, left to rot aboard the warship he exiled into the ether. His weapons from that war are likewise gone, his sword broken in some nameless skirmish years ago, and the claw he stole from his father left at the Legion's last fortress, the bastion known to the Sons of Horus as Monument. He wondered if they still left the weapon on display with the Warmaster's stasis-locked remains, or if they'd given in to their fevered hungers and fought over the right to be its bearer. There was a time he'd be down there with them, waging war at the vanguard, maintaining a steady stream of orders and listening to a flow of positioning reports, all while killing with a smile in his eyes and a laugh on his lips. From this distance, he has no hope of discerning which companies are embattled or even if either side holds to any of the old legion structures. 
Even a cursory glance through the dust clouds is enough to betray the most obvious truth. The Sons of Horus are losing once more, against an enemy horde that vastly outnumbers them. Individual prowess and heroism means nothing down there. A battle can break down into 10,000 duels between lone souls, but it isn't how wars are won. The wind, always a treacherous companion in this realm, carries in frequent scraps of shouted voices from the valley below. He lets the sounds wash over him, without guilt, as unconcerned for the screaming as he is for the way the wind drags at his long, loose hair. Ezekiel crouches, gathering a fistful of the red sand that serves this world as worthless earth. His eyes never stray from the battle, instinct pulling at him despite having no investment in whoever lives and dies. Far below him, gunships crow and caw above the battlefield, adding their incendiary spike to the dusty frenzy. Titans, at this distance no larger than his fingernails, stride through the choke, their weapon fire still bright enough to leave thread-thin blurs across his retina, each one a little slice of razored light. He smiles, but not because of the battle. What world is this? He realizes he doesn't even know. His wandering takes him from planet to planet, avoiding his former brethren when he can, yet now he stands upon a world watching hundreds of his brothers dying without even knowing the planet's name or what they sell their lives to defend. How many of the men screaming and fighting and bleeding down in the valley would he know by name? Most, without a doubt. That too makes him smile. He rises to his feet, opening his fist. The lifeless, glassy dust glitters away in the wind, catching the light from three weak suns before spreading in a thin burst, lost to sight. Ezekiel turns his back on the battle and leaves the cliff behind. Footprints mark his passage, but he trusts the wind to breathe his tracks into memory before anyone catches sight of them. He looks to the horizon, where seven vast, stepped pyramids rise into the sky, shaped by hands neither human nor alien, but wrought solely by divine whim. In this place in space, on every world he walks, desire and hatred forge the landscape more reliably than mortal ingenuity or natural tectonics. He's crossed bridges over oblivion, threaded between islands of rock hanging in the void. He's explored the tombs of Xenos breed kings and queens, and of priceless plunder to lie untouched in the dark. He's travelled the surface of hundreds of worlds in this realm where the material and the immaterial meet to mate, scarcely paying heed to the extinction of the legion he once led. Curiosity drives him, and hatred sustains him. Where once anger was all he needed, defeat cooled the fires of that particular forge, however. Ezekiel Abaddon, no longer first captain, no longer a son of Horus, keeps walking. He'll reach the first great pyramid before the first of the three suns sets. Well, what a story that was. I'd never heard of it before uh, making the switch to this form of content and was looking for something interesting and short enough as a full story, but long enough to reach the length of a video that my analytics have shown me that you guys enjoy the most. I spoke about this along with Oscars One and His Word Only on our podcast, Dark Podcasticum. So if you want to hear something like a little deeper regarding my thoughts on it, please feel free to check it out on the podcast. I'll put the like end credits card as the, uh, as the podcast so you guys don't need to go sifting through and looking for it. Hope you're all having a lovely day and I'll see you in the next one.